Hey guys, um, welcome to 2.0. This is pharmacy law and regulations. So listen, this is a really long um, lecture. Uh, what I would do is I would just pause it and take a break, maybe watch this lecture in 15 to 30 minute uh, intervals, and then take a break and come back and continue because this stuff is really boring, but uh, necessary uh, in order for you to pass your exam. Okay, so let's go with Pharmacy Law and Regulations 2.0. Uh, the caveat here is that a discussion for the PTCE will be the federal standards. We can remember this test is given in like 48 states, and so um, and it's a national exam, so the, the exam is not going to test you on the state that you live in and that you plan to work in or get your license in. Um, it's going to be based on uh, as a national test with federal standards. So, states may vary with their own standards with regards to pharmacy law, but uh, remember if the federal law versus the state law contradict or conflict each other with each other, uh, you always go with the stricter of the two laws. Like, for instance, what if, if the federal law says you have to uh, keep your uh, control records for two years, but the state law says three years, you have to go with the state because that's the stricter uh, of the two laws, three years versus two. So, again, however, for the PTCE, you're, you're only required to, to know the federal law um, as it is the national exam. Uh, every pharmacy technician must be aware of their own state laws, though, when they get licensed, uh, affecting the practice of pharmacy in, in his or her own state. So, laws versus ethics. Um, ethics and laws are related in that both share the social purpose of encouraging the right conduct. Ethics are defined as a study of standards and moral judgment. Okay, so it's about morality. Um, it is a moral philosophy that is influenced by a particular group, society, philosophy, religion, or profession. In this case, we're talking about profession, uh, professional ethics. So whereas laws are enacted by the government uh, to achieve a goal, to enforce those laws, whereas ethics are embraced by a profession without the involvement of uh, government. All right, so 2.1, storage, handling, and disposable, uh, disposal of hazardous substances and waste, uh, MSDS. Uh, we'll get to what MSDS is here in a sec. All right, so the definition, hazardous substance and waste, is any substance that is potentially dangerous and toxic to, organism, uh, toxic to living organisms, and these wastes must be disposed of properly. You know, you don't just throw it on the street or in the gutter. You know, and then it goes out um, and harms all the fishies. So uh, there's proper there's a proper way to dispose of hazardous substances. Um, the management of hazardous wastes at the pharmacy level has become more important as government scrutiny at the state level has increased. Um, not only are, are more fines being levied uh, through these enforcement efforts, but states are creating and enforcing new regulations that are more stringent than those of the federal government. So the management and disposal of expired and unused pharmaceutical products is becoming just as regulated as uh, dispensing these same products. So we really have to, and it's an ethical issue too, we really have to worry about how we dispose of hazardous substances. We, we just can't throw it in the garbage, or throw it in the street, or throw it in the ocean, or in a lake, because it's going to affect other living organisms. All right, let's go to page two. Um, so the Environmental Protection Agency, which you've all heard of, the EPA, they uh, stated that uh, reverse distribution is a legitimate form of handling the processing of unused and expired pharmaceuticals. Uh, there's actually a company called Reverse Distribution Services, uh, RDS, and they provide this service for pharmacies. There's other companies too, not just RDS, but RDS is one of the larger ones. Uh, pharmacies and hospitals uh, can return unused and expired pharmaceuticals for possible manufacturer credit. In some states, a reverse distributor can manage and ship unused and expired pharmaceuticals on behalf of a healthcare facility uh, via commercial carrier or, um, or mail-in services. All right, so the definition here, we're going to talk about MSDS. Uh, I was referring to it in page one. MSDS stands for Material Safety Data Sheets. And what these are is it's a document that provides health and safety information about products, substances, or chemicals that are classified as hazardous substances or dangerous goods. MSDS provides information on the manufacturer 
or importing uh, supplier, uh, the product, its name, ingredients, and properties, and proper disposal of the product. So like if you shop at a Target or a Walmart or Walgreens, um, any chemical product that they're selling on, on the floor or on the shelf has to have its corresponding MSDS sheet. So for instance, if something spills on the floor, let's say it's Clorox, it spills all over the floor, then there has to be an MSDS sheet on how to deal with the spill for the Clorox. And you know, if someone ingests it or gets into their eyes, um, then the employee would go and retrieve the corresponding MSDS so they could deal with the issue. Okay, 2.2. Hazardous uh, substance exposure, prevention, and treatment. So these will include like eye washes, spill kits, uh, and the MSDS sheet. Um, a, chemical hazards and toxic substances uh, pose a wide range of health hazards, such as irritation, um, sensitization, sensitization, and carcinogenicity. And physical hazards, page three. Um, B, Pharmacy personnel have several tools to combat exposure, prevention, and treatment. And these can include uh, eye wash sink stations that you see around the sink, uh, even plastic bottles filled with water, usually it would be sterile water, uh, to shoot a stream into the eye if you get some kind of chemical exposure. Um, spill kits used to wipe up potentially toxic spills that end up on the, on the floor or on the ground, uh, and, and, or, or containers. And finally, your MSDS to that to gives you the information and how to how to deal with the uh, the spill, which potentially could be toxic. And so these will provide information on how to provide quick treatment to exposure of the chemical substance in question. All right, C infection control standards. So these are universal precautions uh, that have established and implemented in the practice of pharmacy to reduce the likelihood of transmitting uh, harmful pathogens. And so these precautions could include um, A, wash hands before and after each medical procedure. Uh, you may use a waterless hand cleaner. Um, B, wear gloves wherever uh, there is a possibility of coming into contact with blood or any other potential infectious materials, body fluids and, and uh, fluids from tissues. Uh, D, sanitation requirements. Sanitation requirements here, number one, all pharmacies are required to have potable water. Uh, for hand and equipment uh, washing. So you, purified water must be available for non-sterile compounding and water for injection or sterile water for injection otherwise known as SWFI or SWIFI, we call it SWIFI, sterile water for injection, or bacteriostatic water for injection is required for sterile compounding. A pharmacy is required to be clean and in a sanitary condition in which adequate washing facilities to include hot and cold water you can't open up a pharmacy unless you have a sink and you have hot and, and hot and cold running water. Um, soap or detergent and air dryers or single service towels. Um, sewage, trash and other refuse is to be disposed of in a safe, uh, sanitary and timely manner. Um, equipment is to be thoroughly cleaned uh, pro promptly to avoid cross-contamination of ingredients and preparations. Um, special precautions are to be taken to, to clean the equipment and compounding areas that contain uh, allergenic ingredients such as sulfonamides or penicillins. All right, let's go to page four. Uh, e, handling and disposing of hazardous waste. So number one, a hazardous drug is one that exhibits one or more of the following effects in humans or um, animals. Carcinogenicity, which is cancer causing. Teratogenicity, which is birth defect causing. Uh, reproductive toxicity, organ toxicity, and genotoxicity. A. Hazardous material is one that may produce an adverse effect on a human being or the environment. B. Infectious waste includes blood, blood products and body fluids, infectious sharps waste, you know, needles, syringes, uh, lab waste, and animal waste. C. OSHA, occupational safety hazard. Uh, OSHA requires that employees be protected from hazardous drugs and chemicals by using PPE, uh, personal uh, protective equipment. That includes you know, your lab coat, gloves, um, goggles, masks, uh, shoe covers, etc. Like the kind of stuff that you would wear to go into uh, making IVs in an aseptic room. Um, D. Um, hands should be washed before and after donning of the gloves. Uh, e. Non powdered gloves should be worn when handling hazardous drugs or waste. F. Hypo 
Hypoallergenic gloves should be available to employees who are allergic to latex. G. Double gloving is required when the first pair of gloves is under the sleeve of the lab coat and the second pair of gloves covers the sleeve of the lab coat. H. Gloves should be changed hourly or after contamination. Uh, I. Uh, gloves should be removed to avoid direct skin contact. J. Face and eye protection should be used whenever splashes, sprays, or aerosols of hazardous drugs uh, could result in eye, nose, or mouth contamination. And uh, F. Spill kits must be available in areas where hazardous drugs are being prepared. All right, let's go to page five. Um, L. OSHA requires that bags containing materials contaminated with hazardous drugs should be labeled hazardous drug waste. Usually these bags, you know, they'll be like bright yellow or, or red. Um, M. Hazardous drug waste bags should be kept in a covered waste container that identifies it as hazardous biohazard uh, drug waste. N. A hazardous drug waste container should be in each. Uh, should be in each or where hazardous drugs are prepared and administered. So basically you should always have these hazardous drug uh, bags anywhere where you're preparing uh, hazardous drugs so you can dispose of them uh, promptly and uh, safely. Oh, the bag should be sealed when filled and the covered waste container should be tightly taped. Now these are all just common sense stuff, right? P. Sharps containers should be used for disposing used needles and breakable items such as ampules, a single and multi-dose vials. Uh, MDV is multi-dose vials, single dose vials, SDV. Q, hazardous drug waste should be stored in a secure area until it is disposed of according to EPA regulations uh, for hazardous waste. Okay, 2.3, controlled substance transfer regulations uh, as required by the FDA, controlled substance transfer regulations. So A, a drug enforcement agency registered pharmacy may transfer original prescription information for Schedules 3, 4, and 5 controlled substances to another DEA registered pharmacy for the purpose of refilling, I mean, uh, refill dispensing between pharmacies on a one-time basis only. One-time basis only. Know that. Remember there are five schedules of drugs, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Uh, one is basically drugs that are completely illegal. Marijuana is in that class. Well, heroin. And then you have Schedule 2, 3, 4, and 5, which are dispensable. Remember that Schedule 2 drugs, uh, you cannot give refills on them. And Schedule 3, 4, and 5, as we're going to state again later, they are refillable up to five times or six months, whichever comes first. Five times or six months, whichever comes first. That's for Schedules 3, 4, and 5. All right, one, the usual method of transferring the controlled C3, 4, or 5 drug um, um, prescription is via telephone from one pharmacist to another. Okay, you would just transfer the drug uh, via telephone talking to another pharmacist, pharmacist to pharmacist. Um, B, Schedule two controlled substance uh, prescriptions cannot be refilled, right? Zero refills. Um, it would be a true-false question if it says how many times can you, or can you can fill a Schedule two narcotic five times? That would be a false answer. So a new prescription must always be issued to fill a C2 prescription. A new prescription must always be issued to fill a C2 prescription. You can now electronically, though, prescribe a C2 prescription. Um, one, a C2 prescription cannot be transferred because it can only be filled once, right? All right, page six. Prescriptions for Schedule three. Four and five may be refilled up to five times in six months, whichever comes first. So let's say you uh, got this Schedule Three prescription in January. You were given five refills. You used up all five refills before June thirtieth. You're good to go. But um, let's say you used up all five refills in March. By the end of March, it's it's not valid anymore. It's it's avoided uh, uh, RX. So again, five refills max or six months, whichever comes first. The prescription may be telephoned or transmitted by a facsimile um, to the pharmacy or electronic prescribing, otherwise known as e-prescribing, as well as it can be handwritten on a, on a security blank. Um, 2.4, controlled substance documentation requirements for receiving, ordering, returning, loss, theft, destruction, okay, DEA. These are DEA requirements. Um, a, schedules three through five, 
There are no special receiving requirements to obtain Schedules 3, 4, and 5 for a pharmacy. The only process that is different is that wholesalers like McKesson or Bergen or Cardinal uh, that will separate controlled substances from non-controlled substance invoices so that uh, they're easier to inventory the incoming drugs. So when you order drugs from these wholesalers, uh, the invoices will, all be, will always be separate. The controlled invoices will be separate from the non-controlled invoices. Um, drugs in Schedules 3, 4, and 5 may be ordered by any method, written, faxed, or verbal, uh, computer via the internet to the wholesaler, or what's called a Telzon machine, which is old-fashioned. I don't even know if they have them anymore. But they're basically like this box with a modem, and you attach it to the phone. And then you push the button, and it, uh, it sends the message via modem signal. Um, two, after receipt, the invoice or packing slip must be dated, signed, stamped with the red C stamp. Stamped with the red C stamp. Okay, C stamp and returned in a secure location in the pharmacy for a minimum of two years. Now that's federal law. There are some states that require three, but remember we're only referring to federal law here. All right, B, C2 ordering and receiving procedures. So this is a little bit more um, detailed. Uh, some extra steps when you order C2 drugs. Um, one, you need a DEA Form 222. Please write that in or type it in however you're doing it here with your um, PDF document. Um, a DEA Form 222 is required in order to place an order for C2 drugs from a wholesaler. Um, it is also used to return C2 drugs to a wholesaler or to send back expired drugs to a reverse distribution center. It basically is just a chain of custody form so that the DEA can track uh, the C2 from uh, when it's ordered to when it's uh, filled by the wholesaler and then received by the pharmacy. Okay, DEA registration. Uh, so every facility that dispenses controlled substances, <coughs> excuse me, must be registered with the DEA. This is a DEA registration. Uh, the pharmacy registers with the DEA by submitting a form 224, a form 224, uh, when they want to get their brand new DEA number. So this is like if a brand new pharmacy is opening and they uh, are going to sell narcotics, uh, they would uh, fill out a form 224 with the DEA to uh, acquire their uh, DEA registration permit number. Let's go to page 7C. So the pharmacy must renew the registration every three years. Um, three, ordering and receipt. Schedule two drugs are ordered by properly completing a DEA form 222, which is a triplicate order form, uh, or submitting it electronically. B, it must be signed by the individual in whose name the DEA registration is listed. C, a DEA form 222 is valid for only 60 days. Please write that in or type it into your document. Uh, 60 days, a DEA form is valid for only 60 days. D. A paper DEA form must be completed with a typewriter, pen, or indelible pencil. You cannot fill it out with just a regular pencil that you can erase, okay? It has to be indelible. E. Only one item per line, one item per line, with a maximum of 10 different items per form uh, is permitted. There's only 10 line items on a DEA form. If you order, go to order 11 different uh, line items, you have to, you need, you'll need a second uh, form 222. Oh, let's see, F, the number of lines ordered must be totaled on the bottom of the form. So when you see the form um, at the very bottom, if you fill out three lines, you've got to put 03. If you fill out five lines, you put 05. And you'll see, well, we're going to go through all this a little later. Uh, G, the unused forms must be kept in a secure location in the pharmacy, right? H, on receipt of medication, the number of packages must be recorded and on a retained copy of Form 222. And the form must be dated and signed by the pharmacist. Again, we go over through the, we go over the whole thing through the PowerPoint uh, lecture series. I, the pharmacy may not use ditto marks for the date or signature. You can't just say ditto because you're too lazy to write the date in twice or three times, etc. Um, J, the invoice or packing slip, in addition to the completed DEA form 222, must be retained in a secure location of the pharmacy for a minimum of two years. Again, two years for the feds. Don't have to worry about any state laws here. C. 
The anatomy of a DEA Form 222, which we went over in the PowerPoint slides, uh, the DEA form comes in triplicate. There's three copies. If you remember, the top copy was blue. I mean, I'm sorry, guys. The top copy was brown. Uh, the middle copy is green, and the blue copy uh, is the bottom copy. And only a person with power of attorney can fill out the Form 222. Um, note, this doesn't have to be a pharmacist. As long as someone has the power of attorney, they can fill it out. But the person who signs it is the DEA registrant. So there's, there's a, there's a, you have to differentiate that, okay? If you're given PO, power of attorney, POA, you can fill out the form, but you can't sign it. It has to be the pharmacist uh, who is the registrant. So a technician can, can fill out the form as long as he or she has power of attorney, but she cannot sign the form, okay? Big distinction. And number one, ordering C2s with the 222 uh, form. Right, let's go to page eight. Um, I, person ordering fills out the top copy uh, with the C2 drugs that need to be ordered for the pharmacy. You must write hard to transfer uh, the writing to all three copies, right? The brown, the green, the blue. Um, two, the top two copies, brown and green, go to the wholesaler. And the bottom copy, the blue copy, stays with the pharmacy. Three, when the, two, when the C2 drugs arrive the next day from the wholesaler, the pharmacist or technician then fills out the blue copy and then staples that or attaches that to the corresponding invoice that invoices the C2 drugs. Um, the wholesaler then will fill out their areas of the brown and the green copy that came from the pharmacy. And uh, they will uh, send the green copy to the Department of Justice and then they will keep the brown copy for their records. They'll fill it out, all out. And then this completes the chain of custody for C2 ordering. Um, two, returning C2s with the uh, form, uh, 222 form to the wholesaler. So it's just the reverse. If you uh, ordered C2, C2 drugs by mistake or you didn't need it anymore, then you still have to execute a form 222, but it's done in reverse. Um, number three, the C2 returns is the same as above, but only in the reverse, uh, reverse so to speak. The difference is that the pharmacy returning the drugs acts like the supplier, so they act like they're the wholesaler. And then the wholesaler then will initiate the 222 form. So you basically have to call the wholesaler and say, hey, I'm returning Ritalin 10 milligram, I'm returning you know, fentanyl patch 100 microgram, and then uh, they'll go ahead and write all that down on their form 222, and then they'll send you the brown and green copy. So the pharmacy will then uh, send the return drugs to the wholesaler and fill out their portion of the brown and green copies. They will send the green copy to the Department of Justice and keep the brown copy for their records. And then the wholesaler uh, will fill out uh, the blue copy because they're actually uh, receiving the drugs from the pharmacy. So it's just the opposite. Okay. Number four, returning expired C2s to a reverse distribution center. Um, number one, so again, the process is the same, whereby the pharmacy is the supplier, right, because they're the ones that have the drugs, the C2 drugs, even though they're expired. And, and the reverse distribution company then initiates the Form 222. Um, and then you go through the same process as you do uh, with two above. Um, D, ordering drugs in Schedules 3, 4, and 5, not a big deal. It's not like you got to do a, execute a Form 222 form for Schedule 2. One, the drugs... Uh, and these schedules may be ordered uh, by any method, written, faxed, or verbal, just like non-controlled legend drugs. All right, let's go to page nine. And guys, if you need a break at any time, just pause the, the, uh, the lecture and then do what you need to do and then just come back. All right, we're on page 9E at the top. So after receipt, the invoice or packing slip must be dated, signed, and then stamped with the red C stamp, right? and retained in a secure location in the pharmacy for a minimum of two years. Okay, F. DEA Form 106. Form 106, please type it in or write it in. This is the theft form for the DEA that must be filled and filed with the DEA. Number one, federal regulations require that registrants, the pharmacy, uh, notify the DEA field division office in their area uh, in writing, in writing, of the theft or significant loss of any controlled substances within one business day of discovery of such loss or theft. So if you didn't discover it for six days, it's okay. But as soon as you discover that you've lost drugs, then you have one day to file the form. 
uh, one business day. Um, if it's on a Sunday, obviously you're not going to file it, but uh, if it's a business day, you have one day to file it once you discover that uh, the drugs are missing. The registrant shall also complete and submit to the field division office the DEA Form 106. So, let's go through this. Know what the DEA Form 222 is, which is to order Schedule 2 narcotics, and DEA Form 106, which is uh, to report theft. Okay, so, G, DEA Form 41, this is the destruction of controlled substances form that must be filled with the DEA whenever you destroy controlled substances. Uh, know the DEA Form 41 also for the test. Number one, G1, only those persons registered with and authorized by the DEA to handle controlled substances may utilize or submit this form. Two, controlled substances being destroyed may be uh, in date or expired. Okay, so they could be in date for whatever reason, but you you need to just uh, you still need to destroy them properly use, utilizing a DEA form 41. H, filling of controlled substances. One, Schedule II prescriptions can be either handwritten or computer generated, but must be signed in ink by the physician, with no allowable refills. Remember, you cannot refill C2 prescriptions. Two. A partial filling is allowed if the remaining quantity is available to the patient within 72 hours. So let's say you, you just happen to be out of Ritalin 10 milligrams, right? Methylphenidate 10 milligrams. You didn't have it all. And so the, the quantity was for quantity of 30, but you only had 10 tablets. Well, to fill those uh, 20 tablets, the balance of that prescription, you have only 72 hours to fill the balance. 72 hours, okay? Where on number two, a partial filling is allowed if the remaining quantity is available to the patient within 72 hours. Please type that in or write it into your PDF form. Three, a new prescription must be issued by the prescriber if additional quantities are to be provided after 72 hours. Four, the pharmacist should notify the physician if the balance cannot be provided to the patient. So if they can't do it within 72 hours, they should notify uh, the physician so that the physician can um, take some alternative steps, either write another prescription or have the patient go to a different pharmacy. I'm going to take a break and drink some chocolate milk because I'm tired of drinking water. I'm losing my voice. But in the meantime, let's go to page 10, guys. Chocolate milk does the body good. I said there was a study on chocolate milk. I don't know who actually did the study, but they were saying that uh, it was good for recovery for athletes. <laughs> Go figure. All right, number 10. I, um, emergency filling of Schedule II drug prescriptions. One, an oral prescription can be issued to a pharmacy under the following conditions. A, the pharmacist must make a good faith effort to identify the physician. B, the prescription is limited to a quantity to treat the patient during this emergency period. In other words, if the emergency period, if you can uh, act within seven days, and, and you, um, then you, know, you only want to give them just enough to get over uh, that emergency period. B, prescription is limited to a quantity to treat the patient during this emergency period. Just enough just to treat the patient during the emergency period. C, the pharmacist must reduce order to writing. D, the physician must write a prescription for this emergency quantity, and the pharmacy must receive it within seven days of the oral order. So, if the physician is going to call it in verbally like this, they have to get it to the pharmacy in writing within seven days, otherwise they're going to be out of compliance with the DEA. E, if the pharmacy does not receive the written prescription, the DEA must be notified immediately. Okay? J, Schedule three through five drugs. One, a prescription may be handwritten or, compu or computer generated by a physician's office, but it must be signed by the physician in ink. Two, the physician's office may telephone a schedule three through five uh, drug prescription into the pharmacy or may fax one depending on state law. Three, electronic prescriptions for schedule three through five are permitted, just like schedule two. Uh, four, a patient may receive up to five refills within six months of the date, whichever comes first. Uh, 
So again, a patient may receive up to five refills within six months of the date the prescription was written if authorized. So this is again for schedules three, four, and five. Remember, schedule two is non-refillable. Um, five partial fillings are permitted as long as refills are indicated in the original prescription. Uh, and refills do not exceed the total quantity prescribed by the physician. And no partial filling occurs after six months of the original date of the prescription. You still got to go with the six month rule. Okay, 2.5 formula to verify the validity of a prescriber's DEA number. We went through this in the PowerPoint slides, but you have to know um, how to calculate a good DEA uh, number. All right, let's go to page 11A. So the DEA number, this is the registration number that is given uh, to the prescriber or a pharmacy or wholesaler by the DEA. And this is a number that, that is a particular, it's a unique number, that is assigned to healthcare providers like physicians, dentists, um, veterinarians, pharmacies, etc. by the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency, the DEA, allowing them to write prescriptions for controlled drugs. It also is often used by the uh, industry, insurance companies, uh, as a general prescriber number that is a unique identifier for anyone who could prescribe medication. So the insurance industry, like when you process a prescription online to adjudicate it online, they utilize the doctor's uh, DEA number as a unique identifier. Uh, that's why you always have to have all the DEA numbers for every doctor uh, that you uh, dispense medications for in your computer system or you won't be able to build, build the insurance. Uh, number one, a valid DEA number consists of two letters, six numbers, and one check digit. So it's basically two, it's alphanumeric, two uh, alpha letters, and then um, seven uh, um, numbers, seven digits. The last number is the check digit. Okay, so then the first letter is a code identifying the type of registrant, and the second letter is the first letter of the registrant's last name. Of the seven digits that follows, the seventh digit is a checksum that is calculated as, and then here's the whole thing, the rigmarole on how to calculate it. We went through it. Uh, you've gone through problems, uh, math problems on it. You've gone through the PowerPoint slides. But let me, um, this, let's go down to your where it says registrant type, first letter of the DA number. So usually this first letter is always going to be like A or B. Um, a is like doctors that went to school and graduated like uh, up to 1986, I believe. Uh, B is the newer doctors. I've seen F and G. I've even seen Z now as the first letter for new pharmacies that apply for a DA registration number. Um, if the first letter is an M, they are a mid-level practitioner. So these are PAs, physician's assistant, PAs, or NPs, nurse practitioners. They can be also ODs, uh, these are optometrists. Um, but more, most, most of the time, if you can see the test, it's going to be either an NP or PA, and the question may say, what's the first letter in the DEA registrant's number if they are a nurse practitioner or a uh, physician's assistant. So, um, hey, so let's just take an example. Um, I'm going to write it on the board here. Uh, let's say it's Dr. John Smith. So. All right, so this is Dr. John Smith. He's an MD, okay? And his license number is BS, DA license number is BS157-8-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-
Okay? That's how you calculate the DEA number. So, um, when you get a, a question on a test and it says, is this a valid DEA number, you can quickly kind of go through it and you're going to look for anything that says AS or BS because that's the, uh, the first letter of the last name of the, of the uh, prescriber. Then, um, after that, you're going to look at the seven numbers and you're going to have to do the calculation. Okay, you're going to do it like this. You're going to add the first, the third, and the fifth number. You're going to add that up. You're going to get a, you're going to get a summation. Then you're going to add the second, the fourth, and the sixth number. You're going to add that up and you're going to multiply that second uh, number, the, the even numbers, by two. Um, when you add the, that second number, which is the even numbers, with the odd numbers, um, the first number that comes down is your check, check digit. That should be the last number in the DEA number. Um, so let's say what happens if um, what happens if John Smith was not an MD but he was an NP or he was a PA. He was a nurse practitioner or a, a physician's assistant. What's going to be the first letter of his DEA number? It's going to be M. It'll be MS, right? Uh, there's going to be one situation in real life where sometimes the first letter of the last name doesn't match the second letter in DNA number, and that's when um, women who graduate from uh, medical school, uh, they graduate with their maiden name, they get their license, and then they get married and they change their name for whatever reason. Then, so then you'll see that the, uh, the last name doesn't match up uh, with the first letter of the last name when they graduated from medical school. Okay. So that's how you calculate a DA number. I'm going to erase this so it's not that distracting. Okay. Let's go to page 12. All right, so prior to October 85, um, the DA registration numbers for physicians, dentists, veterinarians, and other practitioners started with the letter A. Uh, new registrant numbers issued to practitioners after that day begin with the letter B, F, or G, and I've seen Z now. Um, so per United States Department of Justice, uh, due to the large uh, type A practitioner registrant population, the initial alpha letter B has been exhausted, so therefore DEA will begin using the new alpha letter F as the initial character for all new registrants for type A practitioner registrants. You know what? I don't think you're going to be tested on, on this fact here. I've never seen a question on the PTC. But do know about the second letter, which is the first letter of the last name. And do know that if you're a mid-level practitioner like a PA, physician's assistant, or an NP, nurse practitioner, that the first letter of that licensure, registrant, DEA registrant number, is going to be M as in Mary, M as in mid-level. All right, 2.6, record-keeping documentation and record retention. This is the length of time that the prescriptions have to be maintained on file in the pharmacy. Um, a. Prescription files including controls are kept legally, federal, by a pharmacy for a period of two years. So two years is, you know, kind of like the magic number, right? Um, remember that state laws may be stricter and can vary with the federal standard. And so the tip is here, you only have to remember the federal standard, okay? But in real life, if the two laws contradict each other, you have to go with the stricter of the two, like I mentioned when we first started this lecture. All right, number one, A1. All controlled substances must be Red Sea stamped in the lower right corner. <coughs> um, B, retention of DEA records. So one, the DEA records are maintained for a minimum of two years, kept separately from other invoices, and be readily retrievable. They have to be readily retrievable because if there's like an investigation going on, if the uh, the board comes in or a DEA agent comes in because they're investigating a doctor, uh, they have to be readily retrievable. And they can actually take um, copies of the prescription. They have to give you a receipt for what they take, but they can actually take copies of the prescription. So number two, readily retrievable. It means separated from normal business records or easily identifiable by an asterisk, a red line, or some other usual um, uh, visual identifier, just another visual identifier. Okay, three, the red C stamp must be stamped on Schedule 3 through 5 uh, records, both the prescription and the medication invoices, if they are filed with other invoices. 
Uh, they must be provided to a DA representative within 72 hours after a request is made. Okay, see defective DA form 222. Let's go to the next page, uh, page 13. Number one, uh, a form is considered defective if it is incomplete or illegible or shows signs of some kind of tampering, right? Uh, alteration, erasure, or some kind of change. Uh, then it makes the, uh, the form uh, invalid. The, the, the form 222 becomes invalid. Um, or number two, defective forms, uh, actually de no, number two, defective forms must be kept for a minimum of two years and be readily retrievable. Okay? So, D, the inventories. Um, one, the initial inventory is a complete accurate record of all controlled substances before the opening of the first day of business. So if you're a brand new pharmacy, you, you got your DEA registration number, and you ordered all your C2 through C5 drugs, you have to take inventory. That's your first complete initial inventory, and it has to be an accurate inventory. It's going to be easy because these are all brand new bottles coming into your pharmacy. You've never opened up your pharmacy. So that, you, know, you don't have to open up the bottles because they're, they're, they're full bottles, right? You, that's the way you got them from the, from the uh, wholesaler. Um, and then what's, then you got to do what's called the biennial inventory. So this is taken every two years after the initial inventory is taken. Um, you must have an exact count of the Schedule II prescriptions that you inventory. And then you can estimate the count for Schedules three through five. Um, but the records, again, must be kept for a minimum of two years. Now, there could be a state law that says three years, four years, whatever, but for your uh, purposes for the exam, two years. And don't forget about the biennial inventory, right? C2 has to be an accurate count. C3 through 5 can be an estimate. Okay, number three under inventories. The perpetual inventory shows controlled substances received by the facility, supplied to other locations, returned to the pharmacy, and dispensed to patients. So this is a perpetual inventory. Usually most pharmacies will keep a perpetual inventory of only C2 drugs, right? Um, You'll see a sheet for every single um, C2 drug that they inventory. And then it'll, it'll have the prescription number and the patient and the drug and the quantity, how many is going out, and then whatever's coming in from a wholesaler. So pluses and minuses. They'll put it all in this perpetual inventory sheet. So they know to the tablet or capsule or patch or liquid, whatever, uh, how much of the uh, C2 in question that they have in stock at any given time. The perpetual inventory um, shows the actual number of units of a drug at a particular moment. Okay, I just said that, didn't I? Okay, E, uh, types of prescription filling filing systems for controlled substances. Boy, is this boring. So you can have a three file system, which is three drawers. One file for all Schedule II prescriptions, one file for Schedule three, four, and 5, and then one file for all other types of prescriptions, basically your non-controlled prescriptions. Then you can have a two file system, two drawer, that's one file for schedule two and then one file for schedule three, four, and five prescriptions. And then you can have the alternate two file system, which is one drawer, one file for schedule two prescriptions. Let's go to page 14. And then B, one file for all other prescriptions, including those of schedule three, four, and five. Again, prescriptions for schedules three through five must have the red C stamp in the lower right hand corner. Um, let's go to F, record keeping of controlled substances. So you have to know on hand inventory of controlled substances, right? Uh, then you got to do the biannual, biannual inventory every two years after the initial inventory of controlled drugs, as I've stated earlier. Number three, the DEA requires reporting of exact quantities of schedules one and two. I don't know why schedule one is here because you wouldn't be carrying heroin in your pharmacy. Um, however, registrants are permitted to estimate quantity for Schedules 3, 4, and 5, again, as I stated earlier. Uh, number four, DEA records are maintained for a minimum of, write this in or type it in, two years. Two is a magic number. You don't think you have to know any other number except two years for, for the test. Um, kept separately from other invoices and kept readily retrievable. 
Readily retrievable means separated from normal business records or easily identifiable by an asterisk, a red line, or other visual identifier. Again, I'm just repeating this from earlier. And then a red C stamp must be stamped on Schedules 3 through 5 records, both prescriptions and medication invoices. So the prescription has to have a C stamp and the invoice from the wholesaler has to have a C stamp um, if they're filed uh, with other invoices. So, um, so this must be provided to a DA representative again within 72 hours if they request it because they're doing some type of investigation. Okay, 2.7, restricted drug programs and related prescription processing requirements, for example, thalidomide, isotretinoin, and clozapine. <clears throat> so isotretinoin, this was Accutane, and Accutane uh, was manufactured by Roche. Uh, they had a lot of lawsuits, class action lawsuits, in the hundreds of millions, and so they decided not to make isotretinoin anymore. anymore. But um, Clarivus and Amnestine are two brand names of isotretinoin that, that are manufactured. I forgot who the manufacturers are, it's not important. Um, it has special dispensing requirements. Let's go to page 15. <clears throat> Number one, I pledge. Write that in or type it into your PDF fillable document. I pledge, I P L E D G E, like I pledge allegiance. I pledge program is a mandatory distribu distribution program in the United States for isotretinoin. Isotretinoin is vitamin A. It's a, it's a derivative of vitamin A, but it's highly toxic. It's used for recalcitrant acne. So as I said earlier, stated earlier, it was originally marketed as Accutane by Hoffman LaRoche, uh, but has been discontinued due to the lawsuits. It is intended to pre uh, prevent the use of the medication uh, during pregnancy because it's highly teratogenic. Um, high risk of birth defects, otherwise known as teratogenicity. So this is a black box warning, literally a black box, uh, for the drug, so if you were to pull the patient package insert out of the box, out of the isotretin or the amnestine or clarivus, there'll be a little black box that says, do not um, dispense to or do not give to a patient who is pregnant, because there's a high incidence of birth defects. And this program was instituted March 1st, 2006, so you don't have to know the date. But do know that the iPledge system is used for Accutane, for isotretinoin, for clarivus and amnestine. Number two, doctors and pharmacists are required by the FDA to register and use the website in order to receive this medication. So whenever you see a prescription, you have to go ahead and document it in the uh, iPledge uh, website. Okay, B, 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 clozapine or clozaril. This requires a special process to dispense to patients. Uh, it's called the clozaril or clozapine registry. Number one, clozapine is associated with severe neutropenia, which is life-threatening. Uh, the requirements to prescribe, dispense, and receive clozapine are incorporated into a single shared program called the Clozapine uh, Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy, REMS as it's known, um, or the Clozapine REMS. Uh, number two, the prescriber must be certified in the clozapine registry. So not anyone can just write for clozapine. The doctor has to be certified in order to dispense to write for clozapine. Um, three, the patient must present with lab results each time he or she uh, obtains and brings a, a prescription uh, to the pharmacy to have it filled. The technician is usually in charge of maintaining and sending these lab results to the registry. Okay. So, just know that clozapine also has some special requirements. Um, you have to register, you have to submit the information to the clozapine um, REMS system. And the patient has to come in with lab results each time that they bring a prescription in to show that they're not neutropenic, that they don't have a high white blood cell count. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, a low white, white blood cell count, neutropenic. Okay, and then the, the, the third one here is thalidomide, thalamid. So this was a drug from the late 1950s that caused an enormous amount of uh, teratogenicity or birth defects. It caused malformations and death to children exposed to the drug, but it is still dispensed today for several indications including cancer, HIV, uh, AIDS, uh, Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis, so it still has uh, some therapeutic use today. 
Um, one, the doctor must be certified again in the Thalamid REMS program. Remember, REMS again is risk evaluation and mitigation strategy. Um, so they have to be uh, registered uh, in the Thalamid REMS program uh, in order to dispense the medication and is available <clears throat> only through a restricted distribution program. Okay, slide 16, uh, top 2.8. Professional standards related to data integrity, security, and confidentiality, um, HIPAA, backing up and archiving. Okay, A, data integrity is critical to regulatory compliance and the fundamental reason for 21 CFR Part 11. Uh, pharmacies must maintain the highest data integrity to meet minimum regulatory compliance. B, Pharmacy security is essential in order to maintain pharmacy data. Options include physical environmental, um, environmental security, accurate ordering and receiving of controlled substances. C, workflow tracking through technology. Number one, e-prescribing. Uh, e-prescribing is really uh, picking up a lot of speed here in the last few years. Uh, this eliminates some diversion by removing the opportunity for the paper prescription pad to be stolen, altered, or forged. Doctors are always getting their prescription pads ripped off out of their offices by some drug addict. Um, so they can you know, write forged prescriptions. But pharmacists have a keen eye. They, they know when a prescription has been forged and when it's you know, basically BS. Um, to EHR, so this technology that assists in the recognition of potentially inappropriate scripts with the use of an online of online drug profiles for patients. <clears throat> it reduces diversion by limiting common scams of filling prescriptions for the deceased, <laughs> unauthorized refills, and call-in prescriptions for persons posing as healthcare professionals. Excuse me for one sec. Three, the pedigree trail. You hear pedigree like dogs. Dogs have a pedigree. We have a pedigree where, where we came from. Uh, pharmacists are legally, ethically, and organizationally responsible for ensuring that any drug supplies and or, uh, and or distributed is adequately controlled and that dispensing of drugs is documented. So we have to document and we have to have the pedigree of the drug. So the pedigree is defined as a statement of drug origin that identifies each prior sale, purchase, or trade of a drug, including the date of those transactions and the names and addresses of all the parties involved. It's kind of like your chain of custody, this pedigree, right? And it really prevents um, uh, diversion. It prevents a lot of um, counterfeit drugs that come in from China, for instance. So the pedigree is really important in, uh, in terms of um, making sure that you have integrity with the drugs that are manufactured. All right, let's go to uh, page 17. Number four, pharmacy automation system and robots. You get a lot of, uh, you see a lot of pharmacy automation as technology increases now. Usually technology, pharmacy is like one of the last places to see improvements in technology, but they're getting better. Uh, pharmacy automation systems also provide options for drug tracking and accounting. Options for such monitoring and security include freestanding computer-controlled access and record-keeping linked to various pharmacy information systems. Robots are an example of an automated system that supports security, allow for storage, retrieval, tracking, and securing of narcotics. Five policies and procedures. All pharmacies should have an updated policies and procedures manual. So every pharmacy that you go to has to have a PNP manual. That's one of the things that the uh, Board of Pharmacy Inspectors look for. They, they want to see your policies and procedures manual to reinforce uh, security in a pharmacy. And uh, these can address downtime procedures in the event of software or hardware failure um, or a planned maintenance affecting a normal operation of technologies. Okay, D, HIPAA. You've gone through this. You've you've, you've had a uh, HIPAA. Um, you've had a PowerPoint uh, lecture on HIPAA. So HIPAA again is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. It was enacted in, uh, in 1996 and signed by President Bill Clinton. <clears throat> so HIPAA covers many areas, including healthcare access, renewability, portability, prevention of fraud and abuse, and medical liability reform. For your purposes, though. 
um, you will only be concerned with um, A, the primary goal of HIPAA, which is to protect the patient's protected health information, PHI. No PHI for the exam. If you say PHI, personal health information, that's the wrong answer. It's protected, not personal. Protected health information, PHI. B, any pharmacy that maintains a patient's health information in an electronic format or conducts financial and administrative transactions electronically must adhere to HIPAA. You must adhere to the HIPAA guidelines. C, um, it is the responsibility for each pharmacy to adopt policies and procedures relating to the protection of a patient's protected health information. So a pharmacy must be consistent with handling all patients' protected health information, and HIPAA provides important uh, rights to all patients. You know, it used to be that uh, a health insurance company, before you can buy health insurance, they would get a hold of your medical, medical records, and if they saw some underlying cost and pre-existing condition, they could deny you. So HIPAA now protects uh, the, your uh, health information. Uh, basically, it's saying that you own your health information and no one else. All right, so it provides important rights to the patients, and these rights include, I, a right to access their information. Let's go to page 18 at the top. Uh, double I, or two. A right to seek details of the disclosure of their PHI, protected health information. Triple I, or three. A right to view a pharmacy's policies and procedures regarding their PHI. These are the rights of a patient's, uh, patient's HIPAA rights. D, there are five essential components of PHI to which a pharmacy must adhere. Five essential components. Let's go through it. One, each pharmacy must take reasonable precautions to limit the use, disclosure of, and request of PHI. A pharmacy must put into practical, reasonable policies and procedures that limit how PHI is used, disclosed, and requested. The policy should be conspicuously posted on a wall somewhere in the pharmacy. Two, all individuals must be informed of the privacy practices of the pharmacy, and this information must be provided to the patient on the date of the first prescription process. It is the responsibility of the pharmacist to attempt to obtain a written acknowledgement from the patient. Three, a compliance officer must be appointed to ensure compliance with HIPAA. So every pharmacy must have their own a compliance officer. If you're the owner of the pharmacy, you're, you're the compliance officer by default. Um, number four, all employees working in a pharmacy, pharmacists and pharmacy technicians and clerks, must receive training in HIPAA regulations. So, Whenever you go work for someone, um, you're going to be certified for, uh, for HIPAA for that company. And uh, we gave you a HIPAA um, uh, exam on one of the PowerPoints, and that's sort of our way to give you a, a HIPAA certification. If a pharmacy discloses PHI to an individual or organization designated as a business associate, it is responsible of the pharmacy to obtain written assurances that the information provided to the business associate will be used only for the purpose it was intended. A business associate is anyone that does business or has business with the pharmacy. So it could be the pharmacy's CPA or the pharmacy's lawyer or you know, someone who just does basic business with the pharmacy. They are labeled as a pharmacy associate as far as the HIPAA laws are concerned. So these can include, again, also, the store manager, let's say you work in a Walgreens or Rite Aid, the store manager is your business associate. Even though he doesn't work in the pharmacy, he manages the overall store. Could be a delivery person, could be the McKesson wholesaler or Bergen or Cardinal or delivery person, the driver, that's a business associate. Could be the insurance auditor who comes in to audit the pharmacy, that's a business associate. All right, let's go to page 19. 2.9 requirements for consultation. These are the OBRA 90 um, requirements. So A, OBRA stands for the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1990. Know what OBRA stands for. You could get a question, what does OBRA stand for? Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1990. One, this act focuses on federal funding of the Medicare and Medicaid programs. This was the act that created an incre increased need for pharmacy technicians. Why? Because it um, required pharmacists to do mandatory counseling for all patients on Medicare and Medicaid. 
Um, two, while determining that funding, OBRA also man mandated that the pharmacists perform drug utilization reviews, DURs, and offer counseling to patients. It even provided funding and set reimbursement fees for such activities. Now, as far as you're concerned, DURs, you'll see that when you process a prescription. If there's some kind of a drug-drug interaction, a drug fruit, a drug disease, uh, you'll get this hard halt that's called a, a DUR, a drug utilization review. You as a pharmacy technician cannot override that DUR. You must call the pharmacist on duty to come in and it forces them to look at what the actual DUR is, what the drug-drug interaction is, or the drug disease, or drug food, whatever the uh, whatever um, prompted the DUR on the computer. And then the pharmacist will override that DUR with their password. Never ever override a DUR as a pharmacy technician. You can potentially lose your job. Um, 2.10, 2.10, FDA's recall classification. We went through this on some PowerPoint lectures. Um, A, prescriptions and OTC meds can be recalled directly to the manufacturer or by the FDA as authorized by the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. In most cases, manufacturers work closely with the FDA and therefore issue product recalls voluntarily. B, the classification FDA recalls. Class 1, the most dangerous potential, and are designated for products that are defective and could cause serious adverse health conditions or even death. So this is the worst kind, the class 1. Class 2 recalls are for products that could cause temporary or moderate uh, adverse health conditions. And class 3, which is the, um, the least harmful, these are for products that would not cause harm, but have been mislabeled or otherwise uh, not in compliance with FDA regulations. These are the most common that you see, these class 3 recalls. Um, C, recall products are returned to their manufacturer directly from the pharmacy. And the manufacturer then gives credit through the wholesaler uh, for the drugs that were returned to them. The technician, however, is responsible for this process. Most technicians in most pharmacies are responsible for drug recalls. And recall products are identified by their NDC number, I right? remember what the NDC number is, National Drug Code, and lot numbers that are on the bottles. Okay, 2.11, page 20. Um, infection control standards. Infection control standards like for laminar flow hoods, uh, aseptic technique, making IV IVs, uh, the clean room, the hand washing, gloves, cleaning, counting trays, countertop and equipment. Uh, these are OSHA guidelines, USP 795 and 797 whenever you're employing aseptic technique to make um, IVs, uh, parenteral drugs. They have to be sterile. A. Infection control is usually associated with intravenous or parenteral preparations of drugs. All members of the healthcare team must be engaged in infection control to avoid sepsis, uh, which is blood infection. Infection control guidelines should be followed at all times. Uh, there are universal precautions. They apply to any person who may come into contact with blood and other body fluids. B. The primary means of infection control is to wash your hands frequently with proper technique. Hands must be washed before donning gloves and after their removal. Always be washing your hands. C. Gloves. And fill this in or write this into your form. Personal protective equipment. PPE. Personal protective equipment. Gloves, such as personal protective equipment, must be worn to protect against contamination. <clears throat> if a glove tears, and these are usually, you know, some plastic gloves or latex gloves, a new one must be replaced after washing your hands. One, when working in a vertical laminar flow hood with hazardous drugs, the pharmacy technician should wear double gloves with the inner pair placed within the cuffs under the gown and the outer pair with cuffs over the outside of the cuff of the gown. So that's called double gloving. Two, other types of PPE, personal protective equipment, include goggles, masks, shoe covers, lab coats, hair, hair covers, um, um, and, you know, gowns. D, all working areas and equipment should be cleaned and disinfected on a daily basis. 
This includes counting trays and countertops and any pertinent equipment. So clean, 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 okay? Especially in an aseptic technique environment where you're making uh, IVs. E, the laminar flow hood or flow hood. Page 21, top of the page. One, laminar flow hoods are used for, write the center, type it in, aseptic technique. Laminar flow hoods are used for aseptic technique. A-S-E-P-T-I-C, aseptic technique. That means um, sterile. Aseptic means sterile. Um, for aseptic technique, used in compounding parenterals, IVs, aseptic means sterile technique. Laminar flow hoods utilize HEPA filters and are designed so that streams of air move toward the front of the hood. Laminar airflow is defined as air moving at the same speed and in the same direction with no or minimal crossover of air streams or lamina. A. Laminar flow hoods are usually kept running continuously. They're usually kept running continuously. However, if the hood has been turned off, it is recommended that the hood be running for at least 30 minutes. Know this amount of time for the test. It is a common question on the exam. If the hood is off, it is recommended that the hood must run for at least 30 minutes before you use the hood. Two, pathogens and particles are kept away from the medications as it is being prepared. So you're under the laminar flow hood, you're doing your little aseptic, aseptic technique preparing your bags. A label is affixed to the intravenous medication bag or syringe. The pharmacist checks the medication for accuracy and may ask the technician questions about the preparation process. Three, there's three types of laminar flow hoods. Horizontal, and you've seen pictures of all of these in, this, in your PowerPoint lectures. Horizontal, whereby air flows from the back to the front. That's horizontal, back to the front. Here, here, Here's your uh, table, you know, you're going into the laminar flow hood, air is coming from the back of the flow hood to the front of the flow hood. And remember you're always keeping your hands at least six inches in from the edge. So this type is usually used for non-cytotoxic or non-hazardous drugs. Again, this is all review, you guys. Horizontal laminar flow hoods are used for non-cytotoxic, non-hazardous drugs, like antibiotics. B. Vertical, vertical flow hoods, whereby air flows downward from a filter, HEPA filter, positioned above the work surface. So you have your table and horizontal, the air is coming from the back to the front, but in a vertical flow hood, air comes from the top to the bottom. Uh, this is usually used for cytotoxic or hazardous drugs like chemo drugs, chemotherapeutic drugs, um, cancer drugs. Uh, vertical hoods also have a protective glass shield that descends from the top of the cabinet to provide extra protection for the pharmacy technician or pharmacist. So usually in these vertical flow hoods, it's not completely open. There's a glass that comes in and covers your face that, you know, it, it acts as an anti-spill or um, if anything splashes, it'll, it'll hit that glass before it hits your face. All right, let's go to um, number 22, top of the page. The Biological Safety Cabinets, or BSC. This is also a laminar flow cabinet, and it can be vertical or horizontal. It is primarily used for preparing hazardous drugs, like chemo drugs, and the Biological Safety Cabinet should contain a covered uh, needle containers uh, for disposal and a covered waste container for excess fluid disposal. Um, Non-compliance in using a Biological Safety Cabinet greatly increases exposure to hazardous substances. Therefore, a technician must always, always follow the strict guidelines for proper use of a biological safety cabinet. They, they, um, you see, we have given you pictures of a biological safety cabinet, a vertical laminar flow hood, and a horizontal one. Uh, but biological safety cabinets can be vertical or horizontal. All right, F, OSHA. Fill it in. Type it in, whatever it takes, however you're um, using your form, your outline. Huh. Okay, so this is the Occupational Health and Safety Administration. Occupational Health and Safety Administration. Um, Google it if um, you don't know how to spell any of those words. 
Um, so OSHA is responsible for developing safety guidelines for the workplace and enforces standards for a safe and healthful workplace for all employees. It also provides training, outreach, and education and maintains a reporting system for job-related injuries and illness, and it reduces hazards in the workplace and conducts audits to ensure compliance of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. One, in pharmacy practice, OSHA has issued policies on hazardous communication standards, hazardous drug preparation, handling practices, hazardous drugs administration, hazardous drugs caregiving, disposable, uh, disposal of hazardous drugs, storage of hazardous drugs, uh, latex allergies, ergonomics, and workplace violence. So without OSHA to protect the employee, uh, employers could basically pretty much um, violate and really abuse their employees. So OSHA was really important as far as providing a safe um, working environment for employees. G, storage and handling requirements for hazardous substances. One, chemotherapeutic agents and cytotoxic materials. A, these must be prepared in biological safety cabinets or vertical uh, laminar flow hoods uh, and placed in bags identifying them as such. The preparer should wear a gown, goggles, and two pairs of gloves to protect him or her from possible contamination. A 4x4 piece of gauze should be kept inside the hood in case of a spill. A preparer should know the location of the cleanup kit, refer to OSHA guidelines regarding the storage and handling of chemotherapeutic agents. So if you get uh, a question that says, um, in what kind of flow hood uh, do you prepare chemotherapeutic drugs? Well, it should be a vertical laminar flow hood or a vertical biological safety cabinet, not horizontal. Two, hazardous substances. Let's go to page 23. Um, A above. These include syringes, needles, and toxic medications. B, used needles and syringes should be placed in red plastic sharps containers to be autoclaved and disposed of. Toxic substances, for example, chemotherapeutic agents, should be placed in a red biohazard bag to be picked up by the appropriate authorities for destruction. These are usually biohazard companies that come and pick up uh, biohazard materials. H, the USP 795 guidelines and 797. So if you are a compounding pharmacy and you compound drugs and also do IV preparation or even in your inpatient in a hospital, you have to abide by USP, United States Pharmacopoeia, 795 and 797 regulations. The uh, number one, the USP 795 on January 1st, 2004, the United States Pharmacopoeia published USP 797. And this is a set of official and enforceable regulations governing sterile aseptic compounding. The adherence of USP 797 is a requirement and is enforced by boards of pharmacy. It's enforced by boards of pharmacy, okay, not the DEA or any other institution. The Joint Commission, formerly the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, or JCHO, the Food Drug Administration, the Food and Drug Administration, and other regulatory agencies. Um, the ad adherence of USP is a requirement and enforced by all these uh, uh, organizations. Um, I said boards of pharmacy and the Joint Commission and uh, the Food and Drug Administration, and um, but not the DEA. They don't care about uh, USP 795 or 797. USP 797 applies to any facility that performs sterile aseptic compounding. Okay, the pharmacy technician has many responsibilities with respect to sterile compounding. The use of universal precautions and aseptic technique are essential in the compounding of sterile products. Two, USP 795. Uh, these are published guidelines for the preparation of non-sterile pharmaceutical compounds as opposed to 797, which is sterile compounds. So know, know the difference, know the differentiate, differentiate between the two. 795 is for non-sterile compounding, like, like a compounding pharmacy, a retail compounding pharmacy. 797 is for sterile or aseptic compounding. 2.12, 2 
Record keeping for repackaged and recalled products and supplies. Let's go to page 24, top of the page. Repackaged products commonly consist of pharmacy technicians opening large containers or bulk containers of medicine and transferring the contents into smaller containers, including single or daily dosages like a blister uh, pack. Um, common containers include blister packs, that's what they use for skilled nursing facilities, vials, bottles, cups and bags. Usually light sensitive containers may be needed which are usually amber or brown. Um, capsules and tablets are usually repackaged into blister packs or vials and liquid medications are usually repackaged into cups or vials. One. Repackaged drug products must be labeled with the following information, generic drug name, drug strength, dosage form, manufacturer's drug and lot number. Really important to have the drug manufacturer's lot number because if something is recalled, there's no way of identifying the bottle or, or the, the drug unless you have the lot number. Uh, expiration date after repackaging according to federal law mandates. Repackaging log may also need to be maintained in the pharmacy. Two, recalled products need to be documented, especially if there are actual drugs to be returned to the manufacturer. Duh! Information will include A, the date the product was removed from inventory, B, information to identify the product, um, I, pharmaceuticals, um, which include the drug name, the strength, the dosage form, and quantity removed, um, double I or two. Equipment, devices, and supplies is a product name, size, and any other pertinent information for identification. C, the product manufacturer. D, the lot number or identification number. Let's go to page 25 at the top. E, purpose for removing the drug from inventory, for instance, the manufacturer recall. F, initials of the technician and supervising pharmacist. G, other information is required by pharmacy supplies. 2.13, professional standards regarding the roles and responsibilities of pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, and other employees. This is for the Joint Commission, from the Joint Commission, USP, and uh, Board of Pharmacies. A, professional standards, they are set by the Council on Credentialing in Pharmacy Standards. I mean, in, in pharmacy, which is called CCP. Sorry, guys. Standards, roles, and responsibilities are also set individually by each state if the state regulates pharmacy technicians. Um, most states who license uh, pharmacy technicians, you guys, are regulated by the Board of Pharmacy. Roles and responsibilities are supported by education, licensure, and maintenance requirements for pharmacy technicians. B, the standards are enforced by the Joint Commission, the United States Pharmacopeia, and the Board of Pharmacy. 2.14, reconciliation between state, federal laws, uh, and regulations. A reconciliation between state and federal laws and regulations. So, A, we stated this at the very beginning of the lecture. Whenever state or federal laws conflict with each other, the stricter of the two laws will prevail. Example, federal law requires prescription files to be retained for two years, and the corresponding state law requires the files to be retained for three years. Which one do you go with? The state law, because it's more strict, it's three years. 2.15, facility, equipment, and supply requirements, for instance, the space requirements, prescription file storage, cleanliness, the different reference materials you have, Again, these are all Joint Commission, USP, and Board of Pharmacies. A, facility, equipment, and supply requirements are determined by the respective state board within the state the, uh, the pharmacy is doing business. These include, one, there's a minimum square footage for the pharmacy. Let's go to page 26. We're almost done, guys. Hang in there. Two, bathrooms and water. You must have hot and cold running water, plumbing source, um, including sinks, obviously. Three, there's, there are minimum counter heights and minimum counter space. Four, there are types of prescription file storage systems. Five, there's minimum cleanliness requirements. Six, you must have a class A prescription balance. You must have a class A prescription balance. Seven, must have an alarm system, right? 
Otherwise, people are going to just break your windows or break your door and come and rob all your shit and shoot narcotics. Eight, you must have a refrigerator. How else are you going to keep insulin and vaccines and other type of drugs that require refrigeration? Nine, there must be a safe for Schedule II medications. You don't need a safe for Schedule III, four, and five, but you do need to lock up Schedule II uh, drugs. Ten, mandatory reference materials. We spoke, we, we talked about it during the PowerPoint lecture series, and they're determined individually by each state as far as what you require for your mandatory reference materials. They can include the following, but it's not inclusive. Uh, facts and comparisons, clinical pharmacology, Handbook of over-the-counter drugs, Hansen's drug in, uh, in interactions, USP and national formulary, Goodman and Gilman's a pharmacological basis of therapeutics and Remington's. And finally, guys, man, this is a long lecture. I had a hard time getting through it. B. The above requirements are regulated and enforced by the corresponding boards of pharmacies in which you will practice as a pharmacy technician. The Joint Committee and the United States Pharmacopeia. All right, guys, we survived. Uh, that was a really long lecture. I hope that you paused it a few times and took some breaks. Uh, the next lecture, unfortunately, is just as long, and then um, they'll get uh, shorter, hopefully. Um, anyway, but we will see you in uh, uh, 3.0, and um, hang in there. We are going to pass this pharmacy technician certification exam together.